Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that on this day, while we cannot be together in person, we do get to enjoy a unity, a sweetness of fellowship uh, via technology that is grounded in our love for one another, which is grounded in our love for you, which is grounded in your love for us. We love because you have first loved us. And on this day where we celebrate the resurrection of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we rejoice together, even though separated, we rejoice together in what you have done on our behalf to conquer death, to be bigger and stronger than any circumstance that could cause us fear or anxiety. God, we thank you for this unique season which certainly presents lots of fertile ground for gospel proclamation. We pray that as we broadcast your gospel, seeds would fall into soil ready to hear it. We pray for family members and friends. We pray that you would break up hard ground, that you would create soft hearts, people ready to think about eternity, people ready to consider their own mortality, people ready to consider you. God, we pray that you would help us to be faithful with the gospel and fearless in the midst of our circumstances. Lord, we know that a number in this body of believers have experienced job loss, have experienced significant financial hits, are experiencing health concerns. Some in our body uh, have the coronavirus. Some have experienced in this short time of the loss of loved ones without the normal experiences of being with them, without the normal of experiences of being able to celebrate a memorial service or even to say goodbye. Wedding plans have been disrupted. Travel plans have been disrupted. Work opportunities are disrupted. Lord, many around us are full of anxiety and fear. Some fear getting sick. Some fear government overreach. But we fear the Lord our God, maker and sustainer of the universe. Lord, you are good and you do good all the time. And we love you, O Lord, our God, our Redeemer, who has loved us with an unstoppable love. A love not shaken by circumstance, a love that actually governs the circumstances we find ourselves in. You are the Sovereign One. And you have done all these things ultimately. And you intend in every circumstance to bring about the best for your children. God, we pray that we would rejoice and delight in the things you rejoice and delight in. We pray that you would grant us compassion and an eager ear to listen to the hurts of others and to meet needs and to care for those who are brokenhearted or anxious, fearful. God, we ask that you would help us, even now as we open your word and Reflection on the open tomb, the empty tomb, the resurrection of your son. We pray that he would be glorified and that we would be given courage in these tumultuous times. We ask it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to turn in your Bibles this morning to John chapter 11. As we celebrate the resurrection this morning, we're going to look at Jesus' resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. Now, you know that Lazarus' resurrection is different than Jesus' own resurrection. Jesus' resurrection is called the first fruits. In other words, it was the first of a new kind of resurrection. And Lazarus' resurrection is different than the resurrection you and I will experience as believers. Uh, Lazarus' resurrection was temporary. You know, poor Lazarus is the man who died twice. And he was raised back to a condition of weakness and mortality and earthiness. He was still perishable. This is not what 1 Corinthians 15 describes in our own bodily resurrection that is yet to come. We will be raised imperishable. We will be raised glorious and powerful and supernatural and heavenly. We will be raised immortal. But we're going to reflect on Lazarus' resurrection this morning because it reveals some remarkable truths that we need to know, that we need to take to heart, especially in this time, truths about God, truths about the Lord Jesus Christ, truths about death, truths about ourselves. So what we're going to do this morning is read the entire story 
from John chapter 11, and then we'll back up and just survey a few of these remarkable truths. We'll look at nine of them this morning. But let's begin just by reading John chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sister sent word to Jesus saying, Lord, behold, whom you love is sick. And when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. This Jesus said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death but they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Therefore Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, The teacher is here, and he is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. And said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of a blind man have kept this man also from dying? So Jesus, again being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a, sench, a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, 
come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. This is such a remarkable episode. And we want to highlight this morning several facts, several truths, some of the remarkable details of this passage. We'll look at nine of them that are really helpful for us as we think this morning. We we won't be able to look at all of the wonderful details in this passage, uh, but we're going to highlight nine of these remarkable truths that the raising of Lazarus reveals. Uh, The first one is simply the love that Jesus has for his friends. The love that Jesus has for his friends. Look down at verse 3. The sisters sent word to Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. It was well known that Jesus had a fond affection for this man, Lazarus. He had a fond affection for this family, for Mary and for Martha. They had benefited from God's grace through Jesus' earthly ministry, and there was a a genuine friendship that had formed, and Jesus is said to have loved Lazarus. And the word there is the common word for family or familial love. And then down in verse 5, it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And there you have the word agape, the the selfless, sacrificial, deep love that is so often described in the New Testament. Listen, you need to understand that Jesus' activities in this chapter are in the context of dealing with people that he loves. And the love of God through Christ to those that are Jesus' friends is not divorced from suffering. You should never suppose, Christian, that your suffering is some indication that Jesus does not love you. It is quite the contrary here with Lazarus. Notice what said, Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, verse 5. And then look at verse 6. So, when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. This is a remarkable sentence. I mean, think about this. Jesus healed so many people. Everywhere he went, uh, the dead were raised, uh, the sick were made well, the lame walked, the deaf heard, and the blind saw. And here, when Jesus heard that this good friend of his was sick, he didn't rush off to go heal him. He didn't heal him from a distance. Like he had done so many times before. In this case, he stayed where he was. In other words, Jesus let Lazarus be sick, sick even unto death. Jesus was a four days walk from where Lazarus was, and he did not get up to go heal Lazarus. This is right here in the context where it says that Jesus loved Lazarus, and it says he loved Mary and Martha. Lazarus wasn't the only one suffering here. His two sisters were also suffering. They wanted their brother to be well, and and they sent for Jesus, knowing that Jesus was his hope. There's a second remarkable fact on display here, and it is the doxological purpose of God. Simply put, it is God's purpose to bring glory to God on display in the raising of Lazarus. Notice verse 4. When Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God. That's a remarkable sentence. It's it's remarkable because, well, we do know that Lazarus died. But you have to understand, that is not the end of this story. That is not the termination of this episode. This story ends somewhere beyond Lazarus getting sick unto death. This story goes farther than that. And the end of this story, the the goal of this story, is in fact the glory of God. And notice how it's said in verse 4. The sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. You see, the resurrection of Lazarus is really about the revealing of Jesus. 
The revealing of Jesus as the Christ, the sent one. The revealing of Jesus as the Messiah. The revealing of Jesus as the Son of God. This was all going to be about God's glory. Jesus reiterates this down in verse 40 when he says, Did I not say to you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? That was the fundamental purpose of this whole episode. It was the reason Lazarus got sick. It was the reason that Lazarus was going to be raised. There's a third thing we need to see in this passage as we sort of survey the highlights here. It is Jesus' purposeful use of affliction in the lives of his friends. Look down at verse 6. So when Jesus heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. The the therefore in verse 6 is really remarkable. Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick. Lazarus was a four days walk away. Jesus did not get up immediately and go help his friend. He purposefully stayed where he was two days longer. That meant that when Jesus knew that Lazarus had actually died, he got up and left then, and it would take him four days to get there. That four-day interval is going to be important, uh, as we see in a few moments. But this was purposeful on Jesus' part. Jesus intentionally waited until Lazarus had died. Another way to say this is Jesus let Lazarus die. This was in Jesus' plan. This was Jesus' intention. And this is an affliction. This is a hardship. To to be sick is, is a difficult trial anyway. To be sick unto death is scary. Even for us who know about the resurrection, Mary and Martha had been taught by Christ about the resurrection. They knew that they would see their brother again in the resurrection on the last day. They affirmed that very thing. But the process of dying is scary. And nobody looks forward to that. And so this was real affliction. This was real difficulty. And Jesus is intentional. Even in this real affliction, this real difficulty in Lazarus' life, we should never think that affliction in the life of a Christian is somehow removed from the goodness of God, the purpose of God, the kind intention of God. And I know it's popular for prominent theologians and pastors when tragedy strikes on a national scale to sort of apologize for God and say he wasn't involved, he didn't know about it, he suffers there with you. Look, one of the things we see in this very passage is Jesus' emotion and compassion with those who are suffering while being sovereign over those very circumstances that bring about affliction. These two things aren't opposed to each other, and we see that unfolded in this passage. Bethany, by the way, is uh, a little less than two miles from Jerusalem. Uh, There's another affliction involved here, and it is for Jesus' other disciples. At this point in Jesus' earthly ministry, he is not welcome in Jerusalem. He's been rejected by the Jewish leadership. Uh, They are seeking to kill him. He's already had rocks thrown at him uh, in in a murderous attempt. Uh, The Jewish leaders tried to throw him off the wall in Jerusalem. He has escaped their grasp at every point this time. But the disciples know that Jesus' life is under threat. And they know that their association with him is personally dangerous. So when they hear that Lazarus is sick, they say, Uh, I mean, we know you love Lazarus, but we don't want to go anywhere near Jerusalem. And Bethany is too close. It's too hot there. And then when Jesus is very clear with them and says that Lazarus is dead and says, Come with me they eventually go. But there's a purpose in that even for Jesus, uh, for Jesus' disciples, that they would anticipate the threat against their own lives in what Jesus has in store for them. Look at verses 9 and 10. Jesus says, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Listen, when the disciples thought that Lazarus was merely sleeping, they said, well, he can just wake up. We we don't want to go back there. And Jesus' response is telling. You see, Jesus is walking in, in the blazing light of his Father's will and good pleasure. And as long as he walks in the light, he is safe. 
is safe in the hands of his father. And the disciples still have Jesus, who is the light of the world. Jesus is encouraging them, walk in the light while, you, while the light is here. Walk in the light. You're safe. Listen, every believer is immortal until God decides to take him home. To, to walk in the light of obedience to God, to walk in the light of obedience to Jesus Christ is the safest place to be. Nothing in this world can threaten God's precious ones to take them outside of God's good and perfect plan for their lives and his good and perfect plan for their home going. And so Jesus in this is encouraging his disciples to trust him. There's a fourth, fourth remarkable feature we need to see in this text. It is Jesus' joy in faith-producing trials for his disciples. Jesus' joy in faith-producing trials on behalf of his disciples. Look at verse 14. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad. That's a strange combination of sentiments. Lazarus is dead, and I am glad. And notice what makes Jesus rejoice here. I am glad, or literally, I rejoice for your sakes, disciples, that I was not there, implied that I was not there to heal Lazarus, that I was not there to prevent his death. I'm glad that I wasn't there to heal him. So that you may believe. You see, the disciples needed to be strengthened. And a personal affliction, a trial, a trial in Lazarus' life, a trial in Mary and Martha's lives, and the trial of fear and anxiety going back to, towards Jerusalem for the sake of the disciples. All of these trials were designed by Jesus, purposed by Jesus, to strengthen their faith. Jesus knew that there were areas of unbelief that needed to be conquered in their hearts. And Jesus was the, had the perfect plan to settle a secured faith in the hearts of his disciples. And so Jesus is actually glad about this. He literally says, I rejoice for your sakes. It's really remarkable. And you and I need to remember that we don't always know why afflictions are happening to us. Sometimes we think it's all about us. It's seldom all about us. Oftentimes God designs afflictions and trials in the life of a believer to strengthen your faith, yes, but also to be used by him in other people's lives to strengthen their faith. And so here Jesus employs this trial in the lives of Mary and Martha and Lazarus to strengthen the disciples' faith. And then by proxy, because this is recorded for us in the New Testament by John, to strengthen our faith, uh, to give us a glimpse of Jesus' power and mastery over death, to give us a glimpse of what it looks like to believe and to be raised from the dead. A fifth feature of this passage we want to look at this morning as we're sort of highlighting some of the major points here is our natural tendency to desire a different plan. You and I have a natural tendency to desire a plan that's different than God's. Look down at verse 21. Martha met Jesus outside of Bethany and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, I don't see this as a complaint from Martha. I see this rather as an affirmation of, of her faith, of her confidence. I don't think she's saying, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I don't think she's complaining. I think she's saying, Jesus, if you had been here, after having seen all that you've done in so many people's lives and knowing how much you loved him and knowing your heart of compassion whenever a, a need was presented before you, I could only guess what you would have done. And if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I think she's expressing real faith in Christ. And I think her sister Mary does the same thing down in verse 32. Notice she, she says the same thing. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him, she fell at his feet. She's not standing with her arms crossed, pointing a finger and complaining. She's worshiping and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's almost as if they confess the inevitability of death's failure in Jesus' presence. They'd seen it before. And this really came home when their own beloved brother died. They gave both of the sisters opportunity to express this heartfelt faith in Jesus. 
but it still expresses one of these things we like to say, if only. You know the if onlys in your life. If only we hadn't done this, then this wouldn't have happened. If only God had intervened here, then this unfortunate thing wouldn't happen. And and we second guess God's plan as sort of a natural reaction to adversity. Right? We don't like to suffer. We don't like hardship. We, we love to have an easy, comfortable life where our expectations are met or exceeded. And God knows better. God's plan is always better than our if-onlys. And Mary and Martha wanted, maybe even expected, a different outcome to Lazarus' sickness. But they did not know the plan of God. They could not anticipate the benefits of God's plan. They could not anticipate that what God had in store, what Jesus had in store for their brother and for them, was far superior than their if-onlys. This natural tendency to desire a different plan, I believe from Mary and Martha, comes from a heart of faith and love of Christ. But it also comes in this passage from a heart of skepticism. Look down at verse 37. Some of them said, some of the Jews surrounding uh, the family said, could not this man, notice how they refer to Jesus, not the Christ, not the Messiah, not the Son of God, not the one we've been following because we love him, but this man who opened the eyes of the blind man. Look, they, they recognized John 9 was real. Jesus actually healed the blind man. Couldn't the guy who opened the blind man's eyes have kept this man also from dying? Notice the distancing in the vocabulary here, the the, the way that they say this. These are Jews who are supposed to be there comforting this family. And they refer to Lazarus as this man, and they refer to Jesus as that man. The, the, The distance just shows an impersonal, uncaring, skeptical approach to the whole scene. Their heart is not one of dependent love on Christ. Uh, They are skeptical of him, even though they don't deny his miracles. They're complaining that he hasn't lived up to what they expect he should have done in this case. Skeptics weren't even moved by Jesus being so moved. Just before this, in verse 36, the Jews were saying, See how he loved this man. But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have kept him from dying? They weren't even humbled by Jesus, this one who's done amazing miracles. They weren't even humbled by the visible scene of his emotion and his affection for this family. They're playing armchair quarterback, sitting back in judgment in the midst of real human suffering. Uh, They don't have genuine compassion for the family. They're skeptical of Jesus. Look, it's a natural tendency in the human heart to desire a different plan when things don't work out the way that we would want them. But remember, we are creatures. We are totally and fully dependent on the Lord, and we step out of our place when we think we know better than the sovereign God of the universe how events are to be orchestrated. There's a sixth feature in this passage we want to look at this morning, and it is Jesus' promise to be death's master. Jesus promises here in this very passage to be master over death. Jesus is the resurrection. He is the master, the sovereign. He is bigger and scarier than death. Look, death is big and death is scary. But Jesus is bigger and scarier. In fact, when you fast forward the Bible all the way to Revelation chapter 20 and you get that scene of the throne where Jesus will sit and judge the living and the dead, it is said there that death itself is picked up and thrown into the lake of fire. In Jesus' presence, death itself will die. Jesus is bigger than death. Jesus is scarier than death. And listen, when when the one who's bigger and scarier than death is on your team, when he loves you, when he has called you his own, you have nothing to fear. And we see this in this passage. Look down at verse 25. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection. Jesus is going beyond here saying, yes, I will provide the resurrection. I'm the one that will raise Lazarus. I'm the one that will raise believers uh, at at the resurrection day. 
Jesus goes beyond all of that. He's not just the provider of the resurrection. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and I am the life. And Jesus here is previewing the New Testament doctrine of what it means to be in Christ and connected to Christ. And the New Testament doctrine of of what resurrection life is. Notice what he says next in verse 26. Everyone who lives if he believes in me, will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Martha, do you believe this? These are two uh, seemingly opposing statements in verses 25 and 26. Jesus says, first, if you believe in me, you'll live even if you die. In verse 26, he says, you'll believe, he who believes in me will never die. Which one is it, Lord? Uh, am I going to die and then live, or will I never die? And the truth is, both of those are true statements. You see, the genuine believers in Jesus Christ will come to life after death. Jesus is promising here real bodily resurrection. But there's another sense described in verse 26 that every believer in Jesus Christ has been raised to new life already. A new life that will never end. You see, resurrection life begins at new birth. The day that you're born again, you go from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive, and that never gets undone. Eternal life isn't just about a duration of existence. It is about a kind of life that extends into eternity. It is heavenly life, spirit-produced life that can only be had by those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who have surrendered themselves to him, who believe in his death to pay for sin, and are indwelt by his Holy Spirit who provides that life. This is a remarkable set of statements because Jesus here is previewing his overhaul of death. You see, for the believer in Jesus Christ, death takes on a whole new flavor. If you were born spiritually dead and made alive at new birth, and that life never ends, then what do we call this time period where our mortality takes over and our physical body stops working and you breathe your last breath on this life? Well, the New Testament's interesting because it changes the vocabulary of death. Uh, I've found 46 different euphemisms, we might call them euphemisms, Uh, of death in the New Testament, where the New Testament actually changes what death gets called for the believer. Uh, Phrases like this, um, believers are said to go out of this world. Believers are said to sleep um, at least six times in the New Testament. And and Jesus even previews that here in, in John 11, 11, where he says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. Jesus is using that metaphor of sleep uh, to describe Lazarus's physical death. I mean, we, we would all look at that and say, yes, Lazarus died. And Jesus is already renaming death. Christians are said to go out of this world to sleep. Uh, Paul says he would surrender his body. Uh, uh, a euphemism again for death. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one says we will be changed. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 also says we will put on immortality. Think about that. What is death called for the Christian? Just wrapping yourself up in the clothes of immortality. In fact, it is also said to be clothed. Paul talks about our tent being torn down. A tent is a temporary dwelling. It's not your permanent home. We have a building in heaven, not made with human hands, from God. That's our permanent dwelling. But this tent, this temporary dwelling place, well, we just fold it up and put it away because it's not our home. Christians who die are said to be absent from the body. Christians who die are said to be at home with the Lord. They're said to depart. Oh, he just departed. They are said to be with Christ. Paul described his own death as having finished the course. He described it as being brought safely to God's heavenly kingdom. Paul described his own death as laying aside his earthly dwelling. And my favorite comes from 2 Corinthians 5, 4, where Paul says, that which is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Look, that's what I once said at my memorial service or funeral or or whatever happens uh, after I'm in the grave. Uh, My body would be in the grave. But the reality is 
I will have been swallowed up by life. What a great thing to say at someone's homegoing. Jesus truly is the sovereign, the master, the Lord over death. And he's indicating that and he's about to prove it uh, in John 11 by raising Lazarus from the dead. Number seven, another highlight we'll look at from this passage is Jesus' emotions during times of suffering. Jesus' emotions during times of suffering. Uh, These are found in concentrated uh, form in verses 33 to 38. But throughout this chapter, Jesus' emotions have been on display. In verse 3, he was said to love, phileo, that uh, friend love, family love. Uh, He was um, said to love, agape love, in verse 5. Uh, He called Lazarus his friend in verse 11. We already looked in verse 15. He said he was glad, or literally he rejoiced. Then down in verse 33, it says that Jesus, when he saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. Literally here, the text says that Jesus was outraged. This is a strong emotional statement. What was Jesus outraged about? What was he troubled about as he saw Mary weeping and as he saw the the, the crowd of people around him weeping? Well, the, the crowd here was most likely a hired group of mourners. Jewish traditional law in the Mishnah required even poor families required them by law to have two professional wailers, people who would just stand there and get paid to wail and weep and mourn out loud. They could turn it off, turn it on because they were paid. And they were also required by law to have one flute player. So, I mean, just, just imagine the scene. Here are these professionals getting paid to come around the family and put on a show of mourning And also in this scene, you have the skeptics who don't believe in Jesus, and Jesus knows their hearts. You have the reality that death, which is an enemy, a real enemy, has overtaken Jesus' friend. And Jesus' friends, Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, are in mourning, they're in grief, they're troubled. And all of things are conspiring together in Jesus, who is truly an emotional being, so that he is outraged, outraged at sin and its consequences. Look what sin produces in the life of a friend. It, it brings about death. Every human being since Adam, aside from Jesus Christ, faces mortality precisely because we are sinners. And while Lazarus's death is not connected to some specific sin in his life, we've already seen Jesus' purpose for it. It is the result of sin in general. And and all of this is a cause of of outrage, of, of being deeply moved and troubled in spirit for Jesus. And look down at verse 35. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. This is a a deep, moving scene. This word describes an uncontrollable crying. And so the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. Again, more emotions on display in Jesus. Down to verse 38. So Jesus, again, being deeply moved within. And and this point, probably in in a response to the the skeptics who were saying, hey, couldn't he have have done something about this guy? He opened the eyes of the blind. Jesus here being outraged, even deeply moved within over the death of his friend, over the hypocrisy around him, over the empty show of mourning and the real hurting of his friends. Listen, you need to understand that Jesus is not distant from the brokenhearted. He is near to the brokenhearted. Uh, He says, blessed are you who mourn. He understands what it is to weep. He's close by when his loved ones are hurting. And he has his purposes in these things. One more emotion, if we want to call it that, to point out in verse 41. Uh, They removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes and prayed in the presence of everyone, Father, I thank you. Whether or not this is an emotion or a disposition, Jesus here is expressing gratitude to his Father. Gratitude in the midst of all of this suffering, all of this hurt, all of this angst and hardship. He's expressing gratitude to God for his plans, gratitude to God for his closeness with the Father, and really gratitude here that the Father hears his prayers. 
And he wanted everybody there present to know that he was sent from the Father and he was on the Father's mission here. An eighth reality for us to look at in this passage is Jesus' power over death. And, and here we come to the scene where Jesus actually raises Lazarus from the death. Uh, let's read it together, verse 41. So they removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I knew that you always hear me. Because of the people standing around, I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when Jesus had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. What a remarkable scene. This just isn't done. This just isn't done. Jesus commanded a dead man, an unable man, to obey his voice. And in Jesus' very command was the power to enable the unable man to obey him. I mean, think about that. Walk into a graveyard filled with headstones and speak, command, tell people to come out. They will not obey. But Jesus has power in his very command to do this very thing. It's significant, by the way, in this scene that Jesus waited two days when he heard Lazarus was sick. When he knew Lazarus had died, it was then a four days walk. Four days would ensure that every Jewish superstition would be overcome. A common Jewish superstition in the day uh, was that for three days the soul might hover over a body and, and might recover. So don't bury him yet. <laughs> um, but Jesus waited the four days so that there would be absolutely no doubt that Lazarus was dead when Jesus commanded him to come out. Everybody there on that day knew that Lazarus was dead and that the dead man walked out of his tomb because of Jesus' command. And the power in Jesus' word here is remarkable. This did more than give Lazarus a good story, by the way. This really is a portrayal of Jesus' power, the power of Jesus' word to quicken, to give life, to create life where there is none. And this is right in keeping with who Jesus is. He is the second person in the Trinity. He is God in the flesh. The New Testament tells us that he is the one who actually brought everything into being and sustains it by the power of his word. Listen to Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. God who said, light shall shine out of darkness. Remember when God said that? Back in Genesis, when there was only darkness, and he said, let there be light, and light that did not exist came into existence out of obedience to the command of God. That same God who said, light be, is the one who shines in human hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Listen, what happens when someone is born again? What happens when someone believes the gospel? It simply means that God has spoken, that the Lord Jesus Christ has created by his word new life where there was not life before. And Lazarus walking out of the tomb is a living picture of that power. Jesus alone has that power and he put it on display in Lazarus. Now, Think about Lazarus' story after this. I mean, what a remarkable testimony. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. You need to know, Christian, that your story is better than Lazarus. Again, Lazarus was raised to mortality. You've been given in new birth life that never ends. Life that never ends. You have a better story than Lazarus. A really remarkable power on display in the resurrection. By the way, some have commented here that it's a good thing that Jesus specified who he wanted to come out of the tombs. If he had not said Lazarus, 
perhaps all the tombs would empty. Maybe that's true. We certainly see here Jesus' power over death. And then the last thing we'll look at today is divergent responses to Jesus' power. This miracle is undeniable. Uh, Look what's said in verse 45. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what Jesus had done believed in Jesus. That that is what everyone standing there should have done, right? Someone has power over death. Everyone there should be saying, "Mm, whatever I thought before needs to change right now, and I need to be on that guy's team. That's what everybody should say. Verse 46, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things what Jesus had done. They ratted Jesus out. Really uh, remarkable divergence in responses to Jesus' power. Listen, you see somebody command the dead to walk out of the tomb. You ought to bow down in adoration and worship right then and there. Only God has this power. Everyone should have been humbled here. Well, look down at verse 47. Therefore, the chief priests, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees convened a council. So here were theological and political enemies. They get together and they say, what are we doing? This man, Jesus, is performing many signs. And look down at verse 48. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Do you see what's happening here? They did not deny the empty tomb. They did not deny the resurrection of Lazarus. They admitted it. They knew that if word got out about this historical event, everyone would believe in Jesus. And the result would be that they'd lose their prestige, their power, their position. They knew that their personal livelihoods were threatened by this. What's going on here? What is the psychology behind these men? Listen, they they have a place of power and position and prestige. They have idols in the heart. They've got root passions and heart motives, which are driving their behavior, right? That's how we work. We, We love things internally. And what we love tells us what to do. And, and what these men loved was themselves. They loved their power. They loved their position. The idols of their hearts were their ability to control other people, their, their wealth, their finances, their positions. The resulting behavior of these heart idols in them was their response to Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. They decided lies, murder, cover-up, and a conspiracy to, to bury Lazarus again was the right response to Jesus' power. Think about that. We, we so often build fortresses around what we want to protect. We will often go to great lengths to protect what we don't want to let go. Even if those things are destructive to ourselves, and if those things are displeasing to God, we will protect them and we will defend them and, and we will fight in order to hold on to them. But listen, friends, some things are not worth protecting. Some things are not worth fighting for. Let it go. Listen, political position, earthly power, temporal wealth, it's not worth having if it costs you eternal life. Look, if you're here this morning, virtually, and you're contemplating the the, the resurrection power of Jesus, if you're contemplating what it would truly mean to surrender your life to him, to turn your back on sin, to, to give up those idols that can never satisfy, and to have new life in him, if you're considering that, you need to know nothing is worth holding on to that keeps you from Jesus. I would just invite you, even today, to consider surrendering your life to Christ Listen, you will meet him again. You will meet the Lord Jesus Christ again. And it will not be good if you have not surrendered to him in faith. In fact, you will meet death not just once, but twice. The second death, that lake of fire, is the eternal destiny of everyone who does not believe in Jesus Christ in this life. Friend, 
you can experience new life even today. Resurrection power in your life today. Freedom from slavery to sin. You can be a new creature and you can have the guarantee of eternal life in the presence of this one. Let's pray. God, thank you for this passage. Thank you for your power over death. Thank you for the resurrection of Lazarus, which puts on display your intention to bring to life from spiritual death all of your own. God, we thank you that you are kind to us and near to us in affliction. We pray that the light of eternity would flood into our lives even as we face difficulties right now. And we pray that we would be bold with resurrection adrenaline and power from your Holy Spirit to proclaim the gospel to a world that so desperately needs it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.